You are live now. Go ahead. Good evening students, this is Dr. Sandra McDermott and welcome to the online uh, pre-recording of this first lecture for this evening. Uh, today is April the 2nd, 2014 and we are, as we are looking at the syllabus, we are beginning, we are looking at Unit 1 and for now we are going to be looking at the history of child therapy and I'm going to be taking you through the risk factors um, the, or the eight risk factors for you to be able to understand how to work with children therapeutically. So what I'm going to do um, at this time is to take you through a brief history of what child therapy is. Now child therapy is very, very unique. It has not existed since in the last, uh, as, in, as in the adult treatment. And um, uh, children in their context uh, just sort of came on stream or over, over about two decades ago. And so the study of children and adolescents are part of what is known as the human life cycle. Children are midway on what is known as the developmental continuum. It is where one derives a sense of self-identity and concept through the nature genetic endowment. And so the child interacts with the environment. As you may know, students, that children's behaviors are impacted by the factors of socialization, including the school, family, and culture, and the society. And for your, for the, for your notes, I want to view born friend banners ecological model for, for for the discussion. Well, let's look at the historical context of child therapy. It can only be going, goes back to the 20th century as I indicated. And so the only literature that you'll find on children is really deal with the children who are mentally retarded. So I look at therapy as, as having gone through several stages, and I'll just go through them as I can briefly. First of all, it's known as the early treatment, and that was based upon the systematic and organized care of mentally retarded children who can be traced to Jean Lard, L-A-R-D, in the 18th century, that is 1799, to educate the wild, the wild boy of Averon, A-V-E-R-Y-O-N. So the first therapist, or the first counselor then, was in the early 19th century, by the name, a man by the name of Edward Sequin. He was concerned primarily about the nature, causes, and treatment of mental retardation in children. So Sequin, primarily was, was pivotal in building uh, residential schools for mentally retarded uh, children. And the first residential school was in the state of Massachusetts in the United States in 1848. The second school was built in New York, in the state of New York in 1951. Based upon Sequin's work, there was what is known as the mental hygiene movement. And this hygiene movement uh, led to the establishment of child guidance clinic and the introduction of a new dynamic psychiatry. Now, if you go on slide and well, you know in Jamaica there are a number of child guidance clinics all over all over the 14 parishes of Jamaica. So that's where that the, the matter of child guidance clinics came about. After Sequin, then the, uh, there was a um, and the establishment of child guidance clinic. Then the mental health movement took shape and founded by what by the person known as Clifford Bear, B E E B E E R N. Now Clifford Bears was very very uh, a very important historical figure in that he was responsible for changing the direction of the plight of the mentally ill in the USA. He published a book called A Mind That Found Itself. And this book detailed the treatment that he and others had experienced in the state. 
mental hospital. He was also pivotal in forming the National Committee for Mental Hygiene. So psychologists like Adolf Mayer and William James, another very famous psychologist, were also formed part of that committee. And that committee was solely an educational arm. And in that it worked and liaised with the, with the state hospitals in the states. And the function and the primary goal was to promote the establishment of better treatment methods. And it was also mostly more promotional to promote mental illness and also to prevent it. So it had more, uh, more primary uh, prevention and also secondary uh, care for people who actually had mental illness. So it had two components, one a preventative arm and secondly to actually treat mental illness. So as I said before, that with the establishment of, 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 the, of the, um, the mental health movement, the child guidance movement also uh, was interacted or integrated it. And so uh, in terms of the, the, the further development of the guidance clinic, the, like, like now Whitmer of the University of Pennsylvania was known to start what is known as a psychological clinic. And so he was influenced by Clifford Bears. And so from the clinics, then there was a lot of emphasis on juvenile research. And so in 1909, in 20th century, Clifford Healy in Chicago, USA, uh, founded that clinic. And so it, the, the institute works primarily with juvenile offenders. So you can see directly from history, from, from at least from two, 200 years of development, where the focus was then on mental retardation, but as time progressed, the, the, there are proponents for child for the child therapy, and so what we have now is that the, the Institute for Juvenile Research focused primarily on juvenile offenders, and so with the, with the, with the integration of the child guidance movement. The primary focus of therapy at, at between the 19th and 20th, and 20th century, I should say, was, the, was a multidisciplinary approach. And if you know, look at therapy as it is in the 21st century, that the child is really is a reflection of the entire context, the family, school, home, and, and the child's peers. So I did say before that um, that with the role of, of sequence, dynamic psychiatry was also introduced and how it impacted children. Now Sigmund Freud came into the picture and, and uh, in Vienna and also Adolf Mayer. And they were also critical for studying children. And as, as you are aware of Freud's theory, Freud looked at the psychosocial stage of development. And so um, it, it's very pivotal in understanding Freud's theory in terms of the psychodynamic approach and how uh, that psychopathology came from the fact that children, the past history or past historical events are important. So Freud also was in, in terms of little Hans, that um, he studied little Hans and he's also in terms of theory or diagnosis and psychopathology originated in, with Freud in that he studied uh, little Hans who was a five-year-old uh, child and Hans developed a phobia of white rabbits. And out of this study, Freudian psychoanalytic theory came into existence, largely due to the studying of children. Very important also in this period, in that um, Melody Klein and object relations also came into, into being. And so um, 
where Klein believed in the uh, looking at children in terms of the object relations context. That the that the, the, the object in the child's life enables them to be able to, to become autonomous and to be able to bond. So when we look at attachment theory, we look at object relations. These these theories are very pivotal in child treatment. So if you uh, to understand uh, uh, psychotherapy, you need to understand the historical basis for attachment, such as Baldy, and you also need to understand the historical significance of the object relations theory. And I believe that you should get that some more if you are taking personality theory, you'll get that more later on. So as I said before, that um, Melanie Klein and Anna Freud were also pivotal in that they also looked at the introduced play. So play therapy also originated in um, Freudian psychoanalytic um, ther therapy. And the technique of free association in play therapy activities was also important, as well as projected drawings and dreams that were used to understand children's problems. Another pivotal movement, and this is the last one before we go on to something else, is the, what is called the intelligence movement. And that this movement started with Alfred Binet. So with children also, assessment was important. So when you're doing therapy with children, you are also looking at an assessment from a global uh, uh, point of view. So therapy is assessing the child within the context, uh, within the framework of the, child, of the society and culture. So the, Alfred Binet in the 20th century, uh, had a tremendous influence on studying children, particularly cognitive ability. So if you, if you are aware of the Stanford Binet, which is now the fourth edition, it came about from the study of intelligence in children and how children are able to relate to the environment. So that ends the, the, the brief overview of the history of therapy in children. And I want to also take you to primarily looking then at psychopathology. Now, I will do that much more in depth in the, in the unit, uh, in unit three, week two, when we start that, that, that lecture. But let me just look a little bit at what is developmental psychopathology. Because if you, to under, as I said before, to understand children, understand and to work with them, you have to understand psychopathology. What are you treating when you when you see a child in front of you? You are treating uh, a, a developmental risk factors that is innate in the child and you need to apply therapy to treat the pathology. So basically there are several ways in which to assess psychopathology in children through several theories and models. And I'm going to just go to them briefly. If there are any questions, please free to bring it up in a discussion form and I'll be happy to answer them. But there are, I look at uh, therapy and psychopathology in children as based upon several models. One is known as the interactional model. This is that variables interrelate to produce an outcome. So, how do we work with children? What are we looking at when we want to treat a child? How are we going to treat the child? We are looking from this model that is based upon what is known as the vulnerability stress model. In other words, a child's problem comes from a myriad of psychopathology and how stress and the child's vulnerability, known as risk factors, develops in children. How does the impact of biological, social, psychological impacts the child's behavior in the environment. So in other words, we look at, we're going to look at several factors predisposing, such as vulnerability to anxiety may interact with the stress, the, the, the vulnerability model. This is also known as the diet 
diastheses stress model. Diastheses, D-I-A-T-H-E-S-I-S, stress model. We also look at precipitating factors. Precipitating factors are factors that influence the child in the now. What are the stressors that brings to bear on the child that creates these problems that you see, that you'll be able to deal with? So precipitating factors are immediate. So then there is also the perpetuating factor. Perpetuating factors are factors that are that continue to impact the child. So we may have it may be a combination of genetics or environment, but these the, the child is moving from a stage of acute to chronic. So you may have children who have severe behavioral problems, and there is a predisposition for them to develop adult disorders later on. So for example, a child who shows conduct problems, or a child who has conduct disorder, or, or Simple behavioral problems is at great risk to develop a full blown antisocial personality disorder. The second model I want to talk about then is known as a systems model. And this is that the, under this model, that it looks and compares the difference between normal and what is known as abnormal development. The child is then seen as an active agent in the environment. And there is a history of past experience. So, so, for example, a child goes to school, child starts acting up. Do we look at what do we look at to determine why the child acting up? So, for a child who goes to school, never gives a bit any problems, and so it starts child start the child. I'm sorry, the child starts to give difficult, uh, produces difficulties. We have to look at what are the underlying factors that are that is causing the child to behave in that manner. So the transactional model is more what is known as an integrated model in that we are looking at the child environment impacting the child. The next model is known as the biopsychosocial model. So the biopsychosocial model integrates the genetic component and the environmental and looks takes a comprehensive look at the child. As we look at when in the next year, when we look at inter child interview, I want you. I'm going to be uploading the the biopsychosocial intake that is used in this in the counseling center for you to be aware of some of the things. Or they are the, 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 the segments that we interview, how to interview children. So I'm going to have that uploaded by the administrator, and then we can have that when we talk about interviews. We will, we will certainly go through that. The last model I want to talk about is the ecological model. And this model links the child, the family, within a network of influences. And that it is saying that the family, the interaction between the child and the family can create psychopathology and it can have a great impact. And you are we all are aware that most problems in children come from the family. So this was it. We have looked at several models. What then is developmental psychopathology? Why do we need to study it in childhood? Why is it so important? It is, it is part then of an integrative approach which integrates uh, the, the models that I talked about to deal with problems in children. No one child is the same. Children are unique. They have different temperaments, uh, different, different genetic influences, personality styles, open resources. So what is the characteristic then of developmental psychopathology? Abnormal behavior gradually uh, emerges gradually in the child environment as the child and the individual interact. So we look then at abnormality in children as based upon the person environment paradigm. 
the person environment paradigm. There are several pathways to, to psychopathology. And there are two main concepts which I think you need to be aware of. And it is looking at maladaptive behaviors in children. One is known as the concept of equifinality. The concept of equifinality. And this is that there are diverse parts that can lead to psychopathology, but one is one, one it leads to one outcome. Diverse path the child can take, but it leads to one outcome. So children then can have different paths and have different experiences, but yet arrive at the same disorder or problem. So for example, ladies and, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, a child who has a problem with, with conduct disorder or depression, they may have different ways of, 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 of going through that their own experience. But the, but the same disorder is the same. They arrive despite the multiplicity of, of any of things that they have. They, they, they arrive, the outcome is the same that the child is depressed. The next important concept that you need to be aware of in your uh, work with decide to work with children is the matter of multi-finality. And this is multi-finality is that there are that, that that children also have they also have different experiences. And, but this can also lead to different outcomes. So, for example, child may grow up in an alcoholic family. Child may grow up in a, in a family who is uh, permissive, a mother who is permissive. Child may receive violence, but they may not come necessarily compressed. Whereas another uh, another child in the same family may come. So it is a matter of multi-finality that different outcomes of the child how pathology is manifested suggests that no one child is alike. So we can't really look at children and say that they are depressed because this is the this is the charge in the family. It is based upon a of, of a multiplicity of things. As again I said, genetics, temperament, the child's coping, the child's intelligence, those things can lead to different outcomes. But what I want to know is that both multi-finality multi and equifinality play a great role and a common theme in the development of psychopathology in children. So let's continue with then what is known as the continuity of disturbance. As we look at childhood disorders, we need to understand disorders in order to understand therapy. Once you understand the disorders that, 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 that plague children, you need to be aware of that psychopathology over time is that psychopathology is, a, is based upon a continuum in children. And this continuity in children will also go in or, or translate itself into adult behavior or over adult behavior. <clears throat> so, the question I need to ask you is that does a disorder at any time carry over and make a life? I say yes. If you see this problem, a child who develops problems in, their, in the early stage of their development is highly at risk to continue with the same pathology in adults over time. So if there are issues, they need to be addressed in the early developmental stage in order to prevent chronic happening later on. 
There are two types of continuity of disturbance that I want to be aware of. And then again, you can go back to your notes to view it and ask questions if you think you need to ask me questions, I'd be happy to answer them. It's known as heterotypic continuity. Now, heterotypic continuity is the expression of some disorders that may change with maturation. That is, that as a child develops, symptoms become still symptoms may either remit or they may uh, they may they may ease themselves. Well, let me give an example. For encopresis, which is bedwetting, for example, it's never really characterized in adults. It is a childhood disorder, and once the child, once the ad person grows into adulthood, you never have a child with any reason. It's really very rare for 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 adults to have any. If that's the case, and you're looking at an organic issue, and really it is a medical problem. So, heterotypic continuity is that change with maturation that the that development over time, as time goes by, the, 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 the disorder tends to work itself out. And so the symptoms become either stable. So, for example, children with conduct disorder, the child may either, either, may either uh, the conduct problems may either go away or they may transit themselves into, into, into adult, and into adult with a child may be developed antisocial traits. The second thing I want to let you know is about homotypic continuity. And th this is when that homotypic is that the, there is a likelihood that the, this, that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the behavioral issues or the behavioral problems will continue throughout the lifespan. Okay, that is, that is it so far for developmental psychopathology. I'm going to just briefly look at the risk factors um, for the sake of time. And I want, this is also important, I'm going to go them over. There are normally eight risk factors. Now really, what is a, what is a risk factor? What is a risk factor? Can you tell me what the risk factor is? I want you to, to be able to, when you're doing your discussion, talk about risk. What do you think it is in your experience? In your, if you have had children, many of you may have had your own ch children. If some of you may have interacted with children in the classroom. In the, what's a risk? A risk factor in a child is any, it is any, it is any <clears throat> social or psychological event that is likely to cause a developmental arrest or in impact the child's normal development. There is a there is a there is a video uh, on the that is on the in week one or which is to be able to week two I believe on risk factors. It's a bit it's a bit long but it, it's very very important in understanding how how children how criminal behavior develops. I want you to read, to watch that video, and when you watch it, you relate it to the notes that you have on the risk factors that I gave you. So let's look at some risk factors in children. Now there are there are several risk factors. One is generalized learning disability. Now if you now, as you know. Um, Normal IQ is about 90. Now, children are at a general risk when they are unable to interact and to learn in their environment. And so we have a lot of children who are going to go and look back at some histories, even the prisons in Jamaica, and, and, and also maybe in Guyana and other parts of the Caribbean. We can look back at some of the, the matches of children who fell between the cracks because they, they were not upset. They had issues with learning. And so there was a matter of frustration, and so they they ended up um, on the wrong side of, of life. So I just want to look at briefly um, what that this is a risk factor of learning disability. You can read it on your own. 
The second is I want to touch on is brain disorders. Now, in my experience, when I was working in Jamaica and even in the States, um, there are a lot of children with head injuries, a lot of children with, with neurological disorders, and that can also have a great impact on children's on ch risk factors. Because a child who has a brain, a, a brain disorder or a brain injury, cannot or what is known as you know the DSM five now causes a newer developmental disorders. That child cannot function and have a normal development because they there are the 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 matter of, of cognitive development is impaired. So if you were to for example take a sample in the school system in Jamaica and even Guyana you'll probably find that a lot of children, um, there's a waiting list for them to be assessed because they have brain, and the brain disorders and these, and these, uh, these problems are under assessed. The second thing again is language disorder. Language disorder is another risk where the child is not able to have verbal expression. And so children, um, who get into fight, have issues, get into having emotional disorder. Probably they may have a problem with, with uh, a language, for example. So we look at a new development disorder, like child disability disorder. Child disability disorder, which probably is not no longer in the DSM, uh, or in the DSM PR, 4 TR, but not in the DSM 5. But children who have had um, delayed development can also have language problems. They are prone to frustration, they can't express themselves, and so they end up fighting, or they may end up being depressed, or they may end up um, in being assessed as mentally retarded when, or misdiagnosed or mislabeled. So I want you to look at also focus on language disorder and reading problems. Again, Attachment issues, so the matter of the parent-child bond is extremely important. And so, um, if you were to look at Bulby, Bulby, Bulby's theory with monkeys on the Terry Cross. Now, the matter of that, that, that study talked about that there was a focus on whether or not um, that that people have a innate wiring towards comfort and bonding. And so the matter of the infant monkeys that with, with that that the, the monkeys in the experiment tend to focus on the Terry Clark model rather than a wired model, even though they were even fed, even though they were fed by the wire model. So the matter of what is our contact hypothesis talks about the fact that we are all prone, we are all predisposed and wired for bonding, the bonding process. And this is a very important risk factor because a lot of children in life develop anxiety, develop phobias, develop uh, elimination problems, develop eating problems, and even adults when you look at their roots, uh, personality disorders have roots in insecure attachment. And if you look at in within the, the notes itself, the the matter of this strange situation that there are several there are several types of attachment: the dismissive, the autonomy, and the preoccupation. Um, if you have time, you can look that up in terms of injury and situation to understand the nature of attachment. To understand therapy is to understand the nature of attachment. So when you are working with children, you have to be able to bond with the child. Children need an element of bonding. So it's called the internal working model. So as a therapist or as a counselor, you will need to have this thing that, that, that those characteristics of the internal working model, the child is able to bond with you. In other words, you'll be an extension of the child to significant other or object relation 
in the therapeutic relationship. And of course, we're looking at uh, nature and nurture. We talked about before genes and the environment. And we also talk about the matter of adversity. Now, all of us are endowed with coping mechanisms and coping skills. This is also one factor. Even does a child have enough psychological resources to cope with stress? So, is a child able to deal with bereavement? Loss, divorce. See, children who always see, or you, or you will see when you have come to your study, are children who have undergone tremendous stressors. Severe stress like family discord, dysfunction, divorce, as I said before, domestic violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse. It is a very important. It's very very important for you to understand about the person, the child's ability to cope with their adversity. How is the child coping? The more severe the pro behavioral problems, the less the child coping resources the child has. So let's continue again with the matter of coping and resilience. Now again, I did, when I talked about the matter of the um, precipitating and, and uh, perpetuating and predisposed, there's also the protective factors that are important as a, as, a, as, a, as a risk factor. How are children able to deal with stress? So, for example, play is important in allowing the child to interact to, you know, to, it's almost like a projective identification with the stressors onto a toy. So, so exposure to one or two moderate stress or risk factors only slightly increases the rate of psychiatric disorders. Children are far more likely to be negatively affected when they experience multiple adversities. So a child who's going through severe loss, viral children, for, for example, go through severe loss of the parents going abroad and they can't see them, child acts out. So the protective factors are important. Uh, does the child have adequate social support, family support? So the main risk factors then are, are parental mental health, parental style, and the parent child's ability to, the parent ability to parent the child. Warm, closer, cohesiveness in the family environment. These experiences may exert their harmful effects by hindering the development of healthy responsiveness and social development, which depends on the child's ability to regulate. Now, we all are products of our family. And so you can even know, so, so children tend to model. So the matter of social learning theory is important because children model parent, parent behavior. So the child's ability to regulate his moods, that there is a secure attachment, and there is competent social and perceptual skills, is important for the child to be immune to stress and nervous to deal with coping skills. A child who does not have that in the reverse is, is going to have very serious, resilient, and coping resort problems. Also, school and peer factors are also important. Children go to bullying. We know, we know that the, the, peer, the peer group and the school is one avenue or one context in which there is a great manifestation of psychopathology in the child. So it's important to also, in work with the child, assess the child's relationships. You ask about peer relationships. How do they get along with peers? That is social skills. A child who does not have social skills 
can become is is at risk for suicide, is at risk for depression, and is at risk for gang activity. Okay, I have done I have gone through all the risk factors and I've gone through the notes primarily. Um, we are going to look briefly at the at the the syllabus just to let just to say that um, I want you to pay attention to the <coughs> excuse me to the to to the to the dates of of the assignment. Pay attention to what's required of you. If there are any questions that pertain to the, the syllabus, because I think it's particularly self-explanatory, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This ends the first week's lecture for week one. Bye for now.